ladies and gentlemen, the very powerful and very sexy Eric Liu. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> that, uh, that, Alberto, with all respect, the crush is mutual. <laughs> that was amazing. I thought when I came in here and I saw those, that young ensemble from, uh, uh, call, call, from Chicago called Rhythm System performing, I thought, wow, that's worth the price of the ticket right there. Uh, but now hearing Lily, I'm really like, okay, that's worth the price of the ticket right here. We can all go home now. Uh, but before I let you go, actually, uh, it's not often I'm in a room full of 2,000 incredible leaders, incredible educators, incredible education professionals who are, changing, who are changing our country. And so I actually want to ask you, if you wouldn't mind, to rise so I can take your picture. <laughs> Now, hold on. Now, I'm going to take a short little video, and so on the count of three, I want you to yell leadership, okay? One, two, three. Leadership. leadership. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. I am so, so glad to be with you all here today. And um, I'm fired up. That's right. That's right. That, that never gets old. <clears throat> I want to tell you a little bit about the work that I do and a little bit about the path that I've taken to it and a little bit about what we're going to do to save our country. So I, um, as Lily said, I founded and I run a nonprofit organization called Citizen University. We're based in Seattle, Washington. <clears throat> WEA friends over here. Uh, based in Seattle, but we do work all around the United States. And our work, fundamentally, if you boil it down, is about democratizing understanding of how power works. To even boil it down further, we teach power. Right? And that work, as I'll get into, is born of a lot of different things and different experiences that I and members of our team have had. Uh, but it's also, in some ways, the very product of a very simple fact, which is how I even got here. I'm the child of immigrants. My parents were born in China, fled to Taiwan during the Chinese Civil War, came to the United States in the late 1950s, and uh, at a time when it was possible to pursue the American dream, they got educated here, and they started raising a family in upstate New York. So I grew up in Wappingers Falls, New York, <clears throat> in the Hudson Valley, Wappingers Falls, New York. And I'm the product not only of, well, I'm the product of every possible American institution, right? As my parents uh, like to remind me in that kind of subtle uh, way that Chinese parents can, uh, <laughs> they like to remind me that I hadn't done a darn thing except to have the dumb luck to be born here. That they had done the heavy lifting. They had made the sacrifices. They had made the hard choices. And here I was, coming into the world, 50 years ago almost, in 1968, so in the, at the peak of the power of the world's most powerful, prosperous, educated, civilized country. I just had the dumb luck to, to arrive. And the message that I got at home all these different ways was essentially, how are you going to earn it? How are you going to earn it? How are you going to actually make this dumb luck worth something? Right? And so I grew up with this ethic all the time in my household, uh, which is to be useful. To be useful. Anybody who here speaks uh, Mandarin Chinese, th there, there's a phrase that you never wanted to hear in my household. You never wanted to hear my parents say it about me or to me. And that phrase was meo yong. And just the scorn with which I said that, I hope you get a sense of, uh, you know, meo yong, which means useless. Right? You didn't want to be called useless. You're sitting around while there are dishes to be done. You're useless, right? Uh, you're sitting around complaining while politicians are picking on Asian people. You're useless. Don't just sit around. Don't just wait for someone to clean that up. Don't just wait for somebody to do something. It's your job. It's your role. It's your responsibility. So I grew up with that ethic. And I grew up shaped by all manner of American institution, but probably none more fundamentally than the American public school. 
I'm a product of the public schools. I'm a graduate of the Wappinger Central School District in Wappinger Falls, New York. I'm a parent of a graduate of public schools. My daughter graduated last year from Garfield High School in Seattle, Washington. <clears throat> and I bet more than a few of you, even outside of the Northwest, have heard of Garfield High School, because Garfield High School is an institution where not only you have incredible, talented, world-class teaching going on, but you have incredible, talented, world-class civic activism going on, right? It was Garfield in the late 60s that was an epicenter for youth organizing around racial justice and black power. And it was Garfield in the last several years where teachers, without asking permission, without necessarily being in the right governance chain of command, started saying, we're gonna push back against this dehumanizing system of standardized testing. And so my daughter was a product of this institution. But that's not it, that, that's not all. I served as the uh, co-chair of two school levies in our district. I served on our State Board of Education. On the State Board of Education, I helped lead a process that was about reimagining the high school diploma so that we could build in more civics, more art, more career and technical education, so that people could be actually prepared in a way that wasn't just about the slogans that politicians of both parties like to say, right? But actually have our students be prepared. And that framework we built for a more robust high school diploma was the framework that legislators used, or actually that the courts used to badger the legislature in our state to meet its, under our constitution, its paramount duty. The paramount duty under the Washington state constitution, the paramount duty of government is to amply fund public education. And so I had a small hand in making sure our legislature finally got off its collective butt to begin to meet its paramount duty. And I go at length here about my path in public education because I want to make a point here. And it's a point that Lily made about her colleagues, about Mr. Rasmussen, about the community there at the school that learned some leadership lessons the hard and painful way. And the point I want to make is this, is that every school, Every public school in this country is a school of democracy. Every public education professional is a teacher of civics. Every student in our schools is an aspiring citizen. Now, I'm not talking about citizenship, I'm not defining citizenship here in terms of documentation status under the immigration and naturalization laws of the United States. I'm talking about this bigger, more capacious, ethical sense of, are you a member of the body? Are you a part of the community? Are you a contributor to that community? Right? In a word, are you a non-sociopath? <laughs> it's, it's worth stating it sometimes, that to be a citizen is to be a non-sociopath. We live in such times. Right? So when I'm talking about citizenship here, I'm not talking about documentation. I'm talking about this bigger ethical notion. And our job, I don't care what your job is, if you're a classroom teacher, if you're a bus driver, if you manage professional systems in a district, our job here is to prepare people. Our job here is to learn from each other, including from our students and the young people around us, how to show up as citizens. And that's what I want to talk about here today, because this idea of citizenship is one that, um, you know, I think... Uh, we can actually thank the current occupant of the White House for something. Th you know, he liked to talk about how he alone was going to solve problems. He alone was going to make America great again. And I will say this about the current occupant of the, the White House. He alone is responsible for the greatest surge in civic engagement this country has seen in 50 years. <clears throat> he alone. He did that all by himself. We are living in an incredible time, right? And I can rattle off the movements, but you know the movements that we're living through right now. Fight for 15, Black Lives Matter, the Dreamers, the Parkland students, Me Too. All these movements now, surging, indivisible, surging now, right? And we live in this remarkable time, and the ways in which we learn from the Parkland students, actually, uh, is not only to be inspired by their fearlessness, and the ways in which they're stepping right into things which they, you know, have no right to believe they're ready to do, 
but they're doing them, right? We can learn from that. But what we can also learn is that citizenship isn't just a cliche. Citizenship isn't just this kind of musty old concept that's about, okay, take out your textbooks, let me tell you how a bill becomes a law, right? And I actually have in our work at Citizen University, we do programs all around the country in different ways, with young people and older people, in red states and blue states. I've, over the years now, kind of come to this very simple formula, this kind of quasi-equation for defining citizenship. Uh, and it's, it's not science, but it, it will look like science. And the, the, the equation goes like this. P plus CH equals CI. What I mean by that is power plus character equals citizenship. All right? So let me unpack that equation for you. Let's start with power. Power. What do I mean by power? You know, I think in a lot of American life, until fairly recently, a lot of people felt like power was a dirty word. It wasn't a word they wanted to touch. It wasn't something they wanted to claim or name. It's kind of impolite in a lot of American contexts to talk about power. Certainly impolite to say, I would like more power, right? But I think one of the things that you all have been teaching the country, and certainly our friends from West Virginia have been teaching the country, um, is that when you fully inhabit that word and that idea, you change what's possible. And I define power very simply, which is this. Power is a capacity to ensure that others do as you would like them to do. Okay, now some people, they're like, mm, they're kind of cringing. Like, that sounds kind of domineering and, you know, a little bit evil. It's kind of, you know, this mashup of House of Cards and Game of Thrones, you know. Um, power is all these dark arts of intrigue and kind of undercutting people and chopping their heads off and stuff. But no, I mean, power, power is. Power is like fire. It's just a flame sitting there. Right? Whether it's put to good or bad use depends on the hearts and the intentions of the people who learn to master that flame and to harness the force of that flame. But power is just sitting there. And if we as Americans, as we as members of the civic body, and if you as educators preemptively decide, you know what, I don't want to go there. I don't want to talk about that topic. I don't want to name it. I certainly don't want to teach it. Well, all you've done is seed the field to other people who are quite happy to benefit from your willful ignorance. Quite happy to exploit the opportunity created by your decision to stay on the sidelines. And quite happy to claim your power and to take it and to exercise it in your name, pretending to be in your voice and oftentimes against your interests. Right? This is why one of the fundamental things we teach at Citizen University, and I say especially to young people, but frankly to people of every generation, is that there's no such thing as not voting. <laughs> There's no, you can say, well, I, I'm, I'm not voting because I'm not happy with the choices, or I'm not voting, it's a protest, uh, you know, or, or, I, or I'm not voting because I don't care, or I'm busy. There's no such thing as not voting. Not voting is voting. Right. Not voting is voting to give your power away to somebody else who's going to lord it over you and use it against you, right? You, to, to, to say I'm not going to vote is just exactly the equivalent of walking down a street with a kick me sign in your back and a punch me sign on your front. Right? There is no such thing as not voting. And so our willingness to name and anatomize and break down and democratize an understanding of what power is, that's our responsibility. I don't care what you teach, I don't care what you do. Right? And in our work and in this book of mine about citizen power, I talk about there being three laws of power. Uh, and I think they will, in different ways, be familiar to you, but I want to name them. So law number one is very simple, and that is that power compounds, right? We, we feel that in our bones right now. We feel that in a time, you know, congratulations. We are living through history right now. We're living through a period of the greatest income inequality and concentration of wealth this country has seen, well, certainly since the eve of the Great Depression and the way things are trending, ever. Right? So we feel it in our bones, the ways in which power compounds, the ways in which not only the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, but those with some voice and some clout will get more voice and more clout. And social media has compounded this to turn clownish celebrities into national political figures. Right? Power compounds, and so does powerlessness. Right? Left to itself, a narrative of, well, I don't have power. 
I don't, I, I'm just my little one vote, my voice. I, that belief that your voice doesn't matter, that your vote doesn't count, is one of the most immediately self-fulfilling beliefs a person can have. When you say, I don't have any power, you make it so. Right? Now, the inverse isn't always true. It's not always true that when you say, I have power, you are powerful. But it begins with that mindset in the first place. Right? And we feel it in our bones right now, the way in which power compounds. And this is, a, this is not just the United States in 2018. I mean, this is as old as human history. It's in Scripture, in Matthew, the way in which those who have shall have more, and those who have not shall be ground down to dust. So that's law number one. Law number two, power justifies itself. So at every turn, incumbent holders of power, and I'm not just talking about like office holders, I mean incumbent institutions, incumbent individuals, people who have power, groups who have power, will spin elaborate narratives about why it ought to be, why it ought to be that way. They will build incredible structures of myth and storytelling and fairy tale about why this is the God-given natural order of things. Right? So let's take one example. You know, there used to be a time in Europe and in Asia where there was a notion, a storyline, a fairy tale called divine right, right, where kings and emperors ruled on the basis of claiming that they were descended directly from God. Right? I'm descended directly from God, so step off. Don't challenge me. Don't question me. Right? I got all the credentials I need. And we as Americans in the 21st century can kind of chuckle at that and say, can you believe that there used to be people who actually followed and listened when some guy came up there and said, I'm descended from God, so you must obey me? But before we start chuckling too much, let us realize that all around us today in the United States, we are surrounded by modern day equivalents of divine right. Right? There are narratives of male supremacy, right? Go to Silicon Valley and talk to, you know, every other tech bro you talk to will tell you why women aren't cut out for the tech world. You go into corporate boardrooms in America and you get a drink or two into them and people, you'll hear from folks about why it is that you have this imbalance of female leadership and CEO roles because, you know, women aren't, aren't meant to make the hard choices. They don't have the toughness, right? Right, Lily? You know, they, 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 don't have, they don't have what it takes to lead massive organizations, right? And you know what that is? That is a fairy tale, but more than a fairy tale, that is a narrative of self-justification. Just as much as white supremacy is a narrative of self-justification. I'd love to give these folks citizenship, but they're, they're not ready to vote. I'd love to include these people as members of the polity, but they're, come on. White people are meant to civilize, whether abroad or at home, right? That's the narrative there. And there's another narrative of self-justification, and it's a narrative of trickle-down economics, right? A narrative that says that the super wealthy are quote-unquote job creators, right? Capital J, capital C, they are like the creator, job creators, and we must worship the job creators. And if we worship them enough and pay them enough tribute and don't look them directly in the eye, then maybe, just maybe, they will let some of their prosperity leak its way down to the rest of us, right? That's trickle-down economics. And again, it's a pretty compelling little fairy tale. And it's especially compelling if it's up against nothing, right? <laughs> if you want to beat a bad story, you have to actually have a better story. You can't just point out how bad and foolish that story is, right? But trickle-down economics the story that job creators, that the wealthy must be taken care of, we must coddle them, we must give them more tax breaks, we must deregulate their lives, we must clear the path for them, right? Because eventually their prosperity will leak its way down to the rest of us. It's a nice story, but there is no actual empirical basis in fact for it, right? But it's good to name and to see these narratives of self-justification. So if all you had were these first two laws, that number one, power is always compounding, and number two, power is always justifying itself, you'd be stuck in a pretty grim doom loop, right? You'd be stuck in this situation where fewer and fewer people were starting to hoard more and more of our power and voice and resource, and then, to add insult to injury, we're telling the rest of us why we ought to be happy about it. Fortunately, what breaks that doom loop, what saves us from that, is law number three, which is this. Power is infinite. 
me say it again. Power is infinite. Now let me tell you what I don't mean. I'm not giving you a, uh, you know, we're in, we're in Oprah's hometown here. I'm not giving you an Oprah line of if you just manifest it, you know, that, remember that book, The Secret, uh, or that video, The Secret? You know, if you just manifest it, right, you can be as powerful or wealthy as you want to be. I'm not telling you that. Again, mindset helps, but I'm not telling you that. What I'm telling you is this, that in civic life, it is entirely possible to generate brand new power out of thin air where it did not previously exist, where others did not think it was possible for it to exist to generate that power out of thin air through the magic act of organizing. Organizing. One or three or five or 10 or 100 or 1,000 or 2,000 other people in some common endeavor with a common purpose, with common language and common strategies generates power out of thin air, right? And this cuts against a lot of intuitions that people have because most people, especially in a time of inequality and scarcity, most people are worried about holding on to what they have, and they're jealous of what the folks next door have. They're not thinking about how they can open their hearts and minds, right? And so in a time like this of scarcity, most people are stuck in this finite, zero-sum idea of power. And, you know, there are reasons to think that. I mean, physics tells you that, uh, you know, in a room like this, there can't be more heat or energy over here without somehow there being less over there. Right? Because that's the law of the conser conservation of energy. Right? But fortunately, I'm not talking physics, I'm talking civics. And civics is the realm where we can create brand new power to thin air. And it doesn't actually diminish anybody else's power to do that. If one of you learns, if young Lily learned how to advocate for Mr. Rasmussen, how to go and pressure the superintendent, how to get her colleagues, her fellow teachers, to vote on something, to pool their sick days into a, into a pot of mutual aid, right? If Lily learned that, and when Lily learned that, and as she did, she did not diminish by one bit my ability to do those things, right? If one of you learns to give a speech in public, if another one of you learns how to canvas and knock on the doors of your neighbors to support public education. If another one of you gets really good at lobbying and working the inside game in your city councils and your state legislatures and in the United States Congress, you haven't diminished by one bit my ability to do the same. All you've done is added to the net amount of power now circulating in our civic ecosystem, right? So these three laws actually yield three very basic imperatives for action for us. And I want to name these because as you go through the next few days, learning from each other, challenging each other, practicing skills, questioning your values, it'll be helpful to have maybe this frame of these three imperatives. So if in the first place, power is always compounding into these monopolized winner-take-all games, then our first imperative is to change the game. If in the second place, people are always spinning elaborate narratives of self-justification about why those who have have and why those who have not have not, then our job in the second place is to change the story. And finally, if power is in fact infinite in the way that I've described, and yet so many people remain stuck in this finite, zero-sum mindset, this idea that the equation always works against them, then we've got to change the equation. And I think it's pretty obvious right now, thinking about not just the age we live in, the last five, seven years, whatever, even the last 15 months. If you look at the last few days, this room is filled with people who have been changing the game, the story, and the equation of power in civic life. Our friends from West Virginia were in a game, stuck in a game where, for a good long time, Legislators and the governor thought, we can jam them. We can throw them a 1% raise and just wait it out. And, you know, they'd gotten pretty good at that game. And it was, to a great extent, an inside game, right? You had to understand the politics of the capital. You had to understand the politics of the budget. 
And most West Virginians, most citizens weren't paying that close attention. And so what did those teachers and educators and professionals do? They changed the game from an inside game to an outside game. When somebody's rigged the inside game, you can try hard to unrig it, and sometimes you will, but oftentimes, as West Virginia teaches us, it's better just to bypass and play the outside game. And that outside game wasn't just about those vivid images of educators in those red shirts. That outside game was saying, you know what, this isn't just a situation where a small number of teachers are isolated and surrounded by everybody else who couldn't care less about teachers. What this game was, was Teachers asking their neighbors to support them. Neighbors cooking meals, preparing meals for the kids during that strike who weren't going to be able to get their free and reduced lunch. It was about families coming together and figuring out in that same spirit of mutual aid, how are we going to pool our resources? How are we going to pool our time to hold each other together here? And suddenly, wider and wider circles of that community in that state started to realize this isn't just about teachers. This is about dignity. This is about respect. Of course, the young people of Parkland are the living, vivid example right now of changing the story. Right? The story that, well, you know, even though vast majorities of the American public support gun responsibility and gun reform measures, well, we've just got a Congress here that won't do anything in our state. And the NRA is so darn powerful, they can just scare any state legislator into inaction, right? And part of that story, too, is, you know, yeah, this is sad that this is happening in schools, but young people, they're, you know, young people don't vote, they don't show up, they don't have a voice, so we can kind of run roughshod over them. And these young people, by leading the way, by showing us what is possible in American civic life, by being our teachers, have changed the story. Now, that story's not finished yet, and they're gonna have to start converting walkouts and marches into applied pressure on legislators, and they're gonna have to learn to read the map of power that, that tells you which member of which committee is the one to really pour it on against. They're gonna have to learn how you actually mobilize in a sustained way narratives of support in the media and beyond. But guess what? They're already learning this. They're already doing it in real time. They're changing the narrative of what young people are about in this country. And as Lily said, that genie's not going back in the bottle. That's a force unleashed. And I'm excited to see what else it's going to change and touch. And of course, both West Virginia and the Parkland students have fundamentally changed the equation of power, the sense that you used to be stuck in a zero-sum thing where people were ground down, and now you can actually do it differently. But I want to tell you another story that's not exactly an education story, but one that's near and dear to my heart. So I mentioned I'm from Seattle. And as many of you know, Seattle was at the forefront of the fight for 15. And some of you may not know, though, that it wasn't really Seattle that got the dominoes falling. It was the little neighboring town of SeaTac. SeaTac, which is the airport town where the Seattle-Tacoma International Airport is, right? A town of a few thousand folks, a town where many of those residents worked in the airport or hospitality business around the airport. Low-wage workers, people of color, immigrants, mainly women of color in these jobs, baggage handlers, hotel maids, people work in the, the rental car operation, right? It was these low-wage workers in the little town of SeaTac that decided, after being ground down by a narrative of trickle-down economics, by being ground down by the kind of politics we've had, they decided to actually perform that magic act and to start organizing. And they started organizing in new ways. And they belied this myth that poor people won't participate because poor people don't have time to participate. Right? They made time after second shift. After church on Sunday, they made time to canvas, to knock on doors. They made time to learn how to give their first public speeches, right? And those low-income, low-wage workers in that community passed a ballot measure in SeaTac to raise the minimum wage to $15. And when that happened, it was a lightning bolt, but when that happened, it was a double lightning bolt because Seattle 
was in the midst of a mayoral and city council election. And so all of a sudden, after SeaTac passes 15, everybody in the Seattle City Council and mayoral race is like, well, I'm for 15 too. Well, I'm for 15 today. Well, I'm for 15 yesterday, right? And what those airport and hotel workers of SeaTac did is that they showed us how to change the equation of power. They were assumed to be voiceless. They were assumed to be completely out of the equation, not part of the picture. And they changed it. And so this set of imperatives about changing the game, the story, and the equation of power are so fundamental to what we've got to do in becoming more literate in power. But now I want to come briefly to the second half of that equation that I was telling you about. P plus CH equals CI, right? CH is character. And the reason why I want to say a word about character is if all you are is fluent in power, if all you have is this high literacy in the skills of how to get other people to do what you want to do, but that skill and that capacity is completely unconnected to any moral sense, to any core moral values or sense of responsibility to others, then you really are simply a sociopath. Right? <laughs> and conversely, if all you have is a deep, deep grounding in character and values and moral principles, but you have no earthly idea how to get anything done, you have no understanding of who decides, you have no notion of how to influence who decides who decides, then you're just philosophizing, right? It's the combination of power and character that actually builds citizenship and is citizenship. And so when I say character, I'm not talking about individual personal virtue, right? I'm not talking about the ways that, you know, Bill Bennett and people like that over the years have talked about character, like be honest, be diligent, persevere. Yes, I'm all for honesty and diligence and perseverance. But what I'm describing is something that you might think of as character in the collective. How we treat each other. How we live in community. Right? How to hold together a body politic. I'm talking about values like mutual responsibility, sharing of sacrifice, reciprocity, deferral of gratification. I'm thinking about a set of principles that say, you know what? Even though so many messages in American life are about raw individualism and rugged individualism and all about this myth that if each one of us individually pursues our most selfish desires and ends and is just a completely self-absorbed jerk, then somehow magically from a million selfish acts, the common good will arise, right? That's a story that's out there in American life, but what we have to do is to counter that with a sense of character that actually says, no, 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 no. Actually, in fact, we're all better off when we're all better off. And what that means is that fighting for the folks who have low wages, fighting for the folks who have the least among us, isn't charity, it isn't being nice, it isn't just good-heartedness, it is self-interest properly understood. Right? And that's how a body thrives. You know, we live in a time where the top 1% of Americans now control 23, 24% of the wealth of this country. Right? In 1980, that was only 8%. Imagine if 24% imagine if of my blood supply was in my pinky. Just picture it. Picture my pinky ballooning with 24% of my blood, right? My pinky for a little while might think, wow, I'm feeling awesome, right? This is great. I'm thriving. Blood's pumping. But it would soon realize that, you know, because my hand would be down here, and as the blood stayed in that pinky there, major organs would start shutting down. The rest of my body would start getting cold. And as the rest of my body started shutting down and dying, just right before the end, the pinky would realize, oh, shoot. I'm, I'm going to die too, right? And that idea is something that we've got to start impressing on our friends, our neighbors, our family members, our fellow citizens here, that we're all better off and we're all better off. That notion of civic character. But there's one other notion that I want to nail here, which is this. You know, those of you who are 
in Chicago for the first time, as you go out over the next couple of days, you'll find there's a lot of traffic around here. It can take a long time to get from point to point in and around Chicago. And I was reminded uh, when I was sitting in traffic today on the Dan Ryan Expressway that I once saw this billboard on I-5 in the West Coast uh, outside of Portland, a totally kind of stuck traffic jam, nobody was moving, and there was this billboard that I think was advertising a bike sharing service. I don't remember exactly what it was advertising, but it had this line there that I'll never forget. And the billboard said, you're not stuck in traffic, you are traffic. <laughs> it's kind of cold comfort when you're sitting in traffic, but, <laughs> but profoundly true. We're not stuck in broken politics. We're not stuck in toxic environments. We're not stuck in a culture that dehumanizes people. We're not stuck in a media culture that belittles people. We are those things. And we either are those things because we're doing some of those bad things ourselves or because we're not doing enough to stop them, right? We are traffic in that way. And so what it means for us to be grounded in this sense of civic character is to remember that we're all better off when we're all better off, and to remember that you're not stuck in traffic, you are traffic, right? And so I want to close with this thought, though. You know, as we get more literate in power, as we think about how to practice power, right? And it's a practice just like, just like playing music is a practice, just like throwing a curveball is practice, just like ministering is a practice, just like being a physician or a lawyer or a nurse or a teacher is a practice. As we learn to practice power and as we learn to cultivate and be explicit about that sense of civic character in ourselves and others, I want to bring it back to the things that Lily was saying about who's in the room here. Right? This is a gathering not to teach leadership, this is a gathering that is, goes back, actually, to the Latinate roots of the word educate, to draw out. This is a room gathered to draw out what you all already know, to draw out of what you know in your bones and have been practicing, to draw out how you lead already. Right? And as Lily said, some of you will lead more strongly in some ways and some of you in others. But as we draw that out collectively, as we take inventory collectively of what this room has, I mean, holy cow, this is one of the wealthiest rooms in America. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about, you know, living large on the Utah State teacher, teacher's uh, pay schedule. I'm not talking about monetary wealth. I'm talking about the commonwealth. I'm talking about the wealth of knowledge, the wealth of experience, the wealth of relationships, the wealth of trust, and the wealth of power. This is one of the most powerful, wealthy rooms in our country right now. And when we take inventory collectively, but I actually want to invite you to think tonight and over the next couple of days to take personal inventory of your own power. Right? What are the forms of power? Oh, I'm not that powerful. I'm just a fill in the blank. Right? I've only been working for fill in the blank number of years. I only know fill in the blank. Right? Push all that aside. Take inventory. Take inventory, take stock of how much people power you have. How many folks could you organize for an action tomorrow? A lot. How much money power do you have? Now, maybe not all of you have it in your bank accounts, but all of you surely have it in other collective ways to move money in powerful ways through donations, through the force of your pension plans, through the pressure you bring to bear in public funding of education. How much ideas power do you have? <laughs> I'm not sure there's a more powerful room in the country when it comes to ideas power, the ability to change stories and change minds about what is and what isn't. You take inventory of that power, and once you take that inventory on a personal level, when any of us does this, you begin to face this very simple binary choice, right? Because you realize, wow, I didn't think I had a lot, but I actually have this, this nice mound of capital here. Of money capital, relationship capital, institutional capital, intellectual capital, moral capital, I got a nice little pile here. And when you look at that pile, you get this very simple binary choice. Shall I hoard or shall I circulate? That's it. It's not more complicated than that. And what leadership is, 
in this moment in American life, where so many folks have the hoarding instinct, where so many folks are living in the fear that scarcity generates, when so many folks do not remember what it's like to be part of something greater than themselves, right? That, to me, was one of the most beautiful things about West Virginia, is that people started talking about, hey, this isn't the first time workers in West Virginia have pushed back against the powers that be. We have a history of this, and there are lessons to be learned from that history and to be adapted to our lives today. But if you, res if you succumb to that temptation to hoard and just keep your knowledge to yourself, then our country will fail, right? And I know you're in this room because you already, by definition, are circulators. You are people who have decided not to hoard, but our job as we go out there and what it means to lead, right? Leadership in this civic sense is not about title or formal authority. It is about, it is about wherever you sit, filling that gap. Wherever you sit, practicing power and coupling it with a sense of character. Wherever you sit, choosing, modeling, egging on others to circulate the power that they have, to share it in a sense of mutuality and share destiny rather than to hoard. And if you do that, and if we do that together, we will change the game, we will change the story, and we will change the equation of power in this country. But more importantly, we will give the United States one more round, one more generation to try actually making a more perfect union. Thank you very much. Thank you.